It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, December 1st, 2011. I am James Burns. We are joined once again by Bob Chapman, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how have you been? Well, pretty good. Pretty good. That's good. I hope you had a really good Thanksgiving. Yep, did so. And me as well. Well, too much uh, GMO turkey. <laughs> Eventually, we I don't have there's... GMO turkeys where I live. Yeah, well, you're lucky. <laughs> We're not. So Although lucky I must here. say, he was tough as tough. <laughs> uh, kind of reminds me of the uh, predicament we're in uh, throughout the world. Tough is tough. It's a good theme for today. Uh, a lot of places we can go with. Uh, we're going to talk about what's going on in the Middle East. Things are getting more tense there. Uh, what's happening today in the Senate? It looks like a you know, unfortunately, this um, new amendments to the uh, National Defense Authorization Act. You know, that's going to probably be a really bad turning point for us. You know, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse in this country. But first, I think we should talk about what's going on in the European Union with their uh, continuing financial crisis. Bob, what is the latest going on over there? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, the the Federal Reserve has said, along with uh, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Japan, the Swiss National Bank, and the Bank of England, that they are going to jointly uh, supply uh, what would you call it? Um, a cash line of credit, uh, particularly in dollars. What has happened in the last couple of months is that 58% approximately of the money market funds and pension funds that buy short-term paper searching for yield were invested in Europe. That figure is down around 20% or lower right now. And that means that these banks in Europe couldn't borrow dollars to complete obligations. And it was kind of a dollar crunch, and it's been going on. And I think secretly the Fed has been feeding them money in the interim anyway uh, over that period. And I don't think that the other banks involved, which I just named, I don't think they're going to contribute anything. I think it's a cover. And I think the Fed is uh, supplying that money for the next year. And uh, I think we're talking uh, something in the vicinity of probably a trillion dollars. So you can make a a mark on the board. Uh, The Fed's going to lend out another trillion to keep things well-oiled. Well, of course, Wall Wall Street thinks that's just uh, terrific. And the stock market's trading uh, uh, 1,200 and something. Uh, Excuse me. 12,000 and something. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the flip side of all that is that the problem hasn't been solved in Europe at all by doing that. And secondly, uh, the consequences for doing that are inflation. And at the same time, you go to look at the new QE3, which I think is already in operation. They're not going to call it that but that's what it is. And uh, they, uh, the Fed, are purchasing toxic waste bonds which contain mortgages. And they're they're purchasing them and uh, putting them on their own balance sheets. The cash goes to the entities, the banks, that had them on the books. They weren't going to tell you how much they paid for them or how much they're worth, because it's a state secret. you got to get used to that state secret stuff. And so anyway, uh, what's going to happen uh, is that they're probably going to spend, and this is my estimate, about $800 billion, maybe a trillion, buying the garbage, and which you get to pay for, of course. And if any of the other loans that were made through that swap arrangement, which I just described to you, you get to pay those bills too. So I see uh, in the next year, 
uh, probably about $1.8 trillion, maybe $2 trillion, uh, being distributed. And uh, that's extremely important. And uh, the reason why is it's going to keep Europe and maybe U.S. banks from going under. And the U.S. banks will use that money uh, in great part to purchase treasuries and agency securities. Of course, the money was made up out of thin air by the Fed. And they'll also speculate with it, probably on, on speculation leverage or maybe anywhere between 30 and 100 to 1. And so that's going to keep the stock market from falling. Yeah, they're just all giggly over that. And so that's what's going on from that side. Now, the other side, the IMF says we're not talking to anybody about giving them any money. Oh, incidentally, that tranche of money, this trillion I was talking about, it's going through the European Central Bank, and they are going to give it out to the banks that need it. And they can do that because they didn't get the money from anybody in the Eurozone. Very important, because it's illegal for them to do that. Okay, on the other front, uh, we get the problems of Greece and the others. The IMF says, no, we're not talking to them. People tell me, yes, they are. Uh, them being the six uh, laggards, particularly Italy in this case. And the word is sp supposedly $800 billion is going to be spent by the IMF in order to bail Italy out. And uh, if you add on the $518 billion already allocated by the solvent members of the uh, Eurozone, uh, then that $518 billion will be used to take care of debt of Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain. Now, what nobody has told them, evidently, is that the bill is going to be $6 trillion, not $518 billion. And if, even if you deduct $800 billion that they're going to give to Italy, it's still 5.2 less 5, which would be $4.7 trillion short of the money that they need for the bailout. At the same time, they're trying to use the crisis to ram through changes in treaty. Now, they're going to meet on Monday, uh, the uh, Sarkozy and, uh, and uh, Merkel, and to change the treaties to read that the ECB can go out and buy bonds from members, uh, they can give members money, and uh, in order for them to do that, there has to be an acceptance by the 17 ancient nations involved. The worst one to convince, of course, is Germany. And uh, uh, Merkel standing up there pounding her fist good communist that she is, <laughs> uh, saying, if we don't have changes in our internal financial structure, what's going to happen is we're going to have another war. Oh, my goodness. Another war? Who's going to fight whom? Don't know yet. But anyway, that's, that's the, uh, the word, so to speak. That's why they are supposed to vote for this. ESM, European Stability Mechanism. Eight people will run the thing. The 17 financial ministers from those countries in the Eurozone, they will meet with the eight and find out how much money they're going to spend on what. The, there is a proviso in this change in the treaty that they cannot be held legally responsible and they can spend all the money they want. At the same time, they're going to take over all of the budgetary and fiscal responsibilities of all the states in the Eurozone. That robs all of those countries of their sovereignty and gets them closer to one world government, which is what this is all about in the first place. So that's what's going on in Europe. Bob, in your assessment, is this going to stop the inevitable? of the sinking of the um, <laughs> SSEU or, I mean, or is it going to lead to something even worse? It's going to lead to something even worse because the more money they throw at it, the less it's going to do in good work, so to speak. 
And you don't have really a liquidity problem. And that's the way they're treating it. You have a systemic insolvency. Insolvency. All the big banks are broke. And the economy's turning down. It's going to get worse for them. And it's going to get worse for the sovereign nations. Next year will be a not so nice year for them. I had a good word for it. I'm not, I, can't, I can't tell you one on uh, radio. But anyway, uh, that's where that's headed. Uh, even though we've had good recent figures uh, in the United States, next year is going to be straight down. Uh, the PMI just came in in, in China. It, it's starting to fall. Uh, same thing in Japan. Uh, you'll see India go down next along with Brazil. And, you know, these have been powerhouses in this last 10 or 15 years. So that's where that's all headed. And uh, it's not going to solve anything. And it's papering it over. For how long? Probably a year. Uh, will it uh, keep Greece from going under? Maybe. I can't say for sure now. Uh, these people are all elitists. They're Bilderbergers. They're members of the Illuminati. And they want world government at, at any cost. They just don't care at any cost. Do you understand? And so they don't care what happens to the people or the economy or anything else, inflation. They want their world government. And you've got two people running companies who are appointed, countries who are appointed in Greece and in Italy. That's absurd. Nobody voted for them. What do they do? Oh, they used to work for Goldman Sachs. And they have all kinds of titles like uh, the Grand Pooh Bar of this, that, and the other thing. And then we got Draghi, who's running the ECB. He's probably the worst of all of them. They're all members of the Illuminati running these countries now. Now, of course, that'll change when the elections come up, particularly in Greece, probably in early February. But uh, this shows you how blatant they are. I have I have a tape in the issue, I think that came out yesterday, and I can't remember because we put so much stuff in. And it's an interview in Greek, and the, inter the interviewer is Greek, speaking Greek, and the questions are giving, given to a member of the parliament, European parliament, from England, Nigel Farage and the subtitles and Farage never addressed this in any of the answers to his questions but he's very good, he's brilliant and he just knocked the whole system down but the guy in Greece kept on saying, wait a minute these people all belong to the Trilateral Commission this guy does, and that guy does, and so on and so forth. Farage didn't rise to the bait, but it's true. Now, what's important about that? That after two years of being on radio and television and in the editorials and even I'm, I'm, I'm even in a, a new book called Boomerang by uh, Michael uh, Lewis on page 79, they quote me as the, uh, I guess, the advisor to the... Uh, Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, so anyway, uh, what I'm saying here is the words getting to the people. If it can get to Greece, it can get to anybody. And they haven't seen the end of that Donny Brook in Greece yet. Uh, this thing is just getting warmed up. But anyway, uh, people are learning who's doing what to them and why they're doing it. And that's good because they will fight harder than they would have previously and not letting that happen or not being used, so to speak, uh, by these people. The and that, that's, that's definitely one of the silver linings, Bob. In the past, you know, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have the alternative media. And, you know, most of the time these crooks and criminals were – you know, had the uh, the luxury to operate in the shadows without ever being caught, but now we're dragging them, kicking and screaming into the light. We're absolutely right, and um, and that is really good news. 
worldwide, not just in America. And, uh, you know, uh, they try to keep so much stuff hidden. I mean, you talked about uh, the uh, uh, the problem with um, uh, this new legislation that was passed by the Senate today, which makes everybody in the country a terrorist. Uh, this is essentially what it is. It's going to be passed by the House and probably will be. Because the people behind the scenes own everybody. But by the time we get through with this thing, everybody's going to know what they did. And we're going to make sure none of them will get reelected. And, uh, but on top of that, if we don't get Ron Paul in, in next November, and people like him in the House and the Senate, you better do one of two things. Get ready for siege, be heavily armed, or get out of the country, because that's what it's going to boil down to. The game will be over. And I know people who are uh, have tried to get passports. Some of them have been reject, rejected three times. Oh, the, the picture you have a slight smile. We can't accept that picture. Or uh, there's some excuse. Now I got my passport renewed a couple of years ago. And um, and so I don't have that problem at the present time. I may have that in another eight years if I live that long. Uh, gee, I'd be 84 then. But anyway, um, they don't want people leaving the country. I mean, I had a letter in yesterday's issue from one of the subscribers. He was with another fellow. They went on vacation. They came back in the country. ICE interrogated them, and one guy uh, had an ICE person uh, interrogate him. And um, he said he was very thorough, very professional, and look, this is what I got to do. And uh, the other guy uh, had somebody who was awful. I won't go into the details. The letter is in the publication. You can see it for yourself. And what they're doing, and these guys both missed their next plane out of Miami to go home. They had to stay overnight for a night in Miami. Unfortunately, they, uh, being subscribers to the international forecast, had the wealth and wherewithal to do that. But that's not the point. The point is they harass anybody going in and out of the country. And it's getting worse every single day. Ladies and gentlemen, America is a police state. And if you don't think so, I guess you get your head screwed on backwards. Yeah, I mean, I agree entirely with that, Bob, especially after today. I mean, with this, um, the new amendments to the National, Authori- uh, National Defense Authorization Act, basically turning the U.S. into a battlefield, turning anybody suspected of terrorism, you know, into you know, saying that the military can come in and arrest you and indefinitely detain you. I mean, this, this is a modern-day witch hunt. Of course. And I'm glad I don't reside in the United States of America because of the content of what I publish and what I put on radio 40 hours a week. Uh, if I was around, I would have been picked up and disappeared a long time ago. And I have been threatened in the past. And that's what the, the, the last reason I left the country. And I've been threatened many times. My harassment began in 1967. So I've been around going head-to-head with the government for a long time. But uh, the turn of events now, if that legislation is passed, and I was in the United States, I would definitely be picked up and put in a camp someplace or Guantanamo or wherever. And that's what this is coming to. And all you people who who want to poo-poo that, you're going to be very sorry you didn't act. If you're going to stay inside the United States, be very heavily armed. Lots of clips, lots of ammo, assault weapons, plenty of dehydrated and freeze-dried food, and a water filter. You're going to need them all. You who can, who all you people who are older, they will pick on you for no reason. They want to get rid of you. You're useless either. Under the new Obama medical plan, you will be deprived 
of medical treatment and allowed to die. You should, if you can, if you get income of, say, 2500 3000 a month, get out. People who have wealth should get out, if Ron Paul is not elected, that is. And you should start looking now at different places, and we tell people where we think the best places are to go. Uh, and uh, people who are in their 50s and 60s, watch out. Anybody they want to get rid of, all they'll say is, uh, we understand that you had something negative to say about Mr. Obama's plans to do this, that, and the other thing. Uh, you will come with us. And that'll be at 3 a.m. And they'll haul you out of your house and you'll never be seen again. This is going to make the Stasi and the Gestapo and the NKVD look like child's play. I used to spy against those people. So I know what I'm talking about. And that's where this is headed, kids. And if you don't think so, you're fooling yourself and you're going to pay for it with your life. But your life's not important. How about your wife and your children and your grandchildren? Is that important? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You make the choice. But if you don't prepare, you're going to be dead meat. Yeah, Bob, it just it's hard for me to imagine that there's not a single person in the United States right now that, that doesn't recognize that over the past decade alone with the passage of the Patriot Act, the Department of Homeland Security, TSA, military commissions, all this crap, like the Constitution Free Zone all over the country, the free speech zones at you know various events like the WTO protests, uh, the G20 in Pittsburgh a couple years back, uh, the, both the Republican and Democrat presidential conventions. And now this, how can you not see the writing on the wall? Well, people are in denial, and they'll always be. Uh, those who won't listen or can't listen are too stupid to listen, and that'll make up half the population. And uh, uh, the other half uh, will realize. And uh, the question is, uh, where will it all lead? You know, it's going to lead to revolution, of course. I mean, where, can it, where else can it lead? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the direction we're heading, unfortunately. And I brought this up to several friends and I, because one thing they've been doing the past couple of years, thanks to a federal grant, is they've been doing these seatbelt safety checkpoints. And I, I try to make the point how th this is a violation of our rights. Don't you see that, that this is what they did in, in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union? And they were all like, you're imagining things. You're blowing things way out of proportion. I'm like, really? I mean, last time I checked, the decision to wear a seatbelt should be an individual choice, not something mandated by the government. And it's not just seatbelts, Bob, as you and I both know. They always ask people for everything, your license, your registration, proof of insurance. So it has nothing to do with And they with can search your car. Yeah. And they can not do that, that here. you have anything to hide, but that's not the point. Yep. And that, that's a ruling, like the state Supreme Court of Louisiana, like a couple months ago. They ruled that a cop could search your car on a hunch. On a hunch of anything. They no longer need a warrant or any other crap. They say, well, I have a hunch you might have something in your car. And if you resist, well, guess what? Well, it's very bad, and it's going to get worse, and it will probably will get passed. And I have told you all what to do. Start looking, especially the classes of people I described. Uh, there's plenty of countries to go to. Uh, maybe a buying time. That's okay. You might buy yourself five or ten years. It beats being dead, doesn't it? I mean, these people are monsters. They're sociopathic psychopaths. I mean, just look at their lifestyle. They've got hundreds and millions of dollars or billions, and uh, they're totally, totally decadent. They're hypocrites. They talk about, oh, we have to follow the rule of law, yet they never follow it. They, they have their own rules. Our rules don't apply to them. Two sets of rules, one for them, one for us. And, you know, that's always been there. It's just that now uh, it's different. Uh, it's in your face. They're brazen. They're arrogant. And they don't care. The judges, they're all in on it. The politicians, they're all in on it. Oh, there's a minority that aren't, but they don't make any difference. No, that's the unfortunate reality we live in, Bob. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. And I sincerely believe that 
Ron Paul has a real chance now of actually pulling this off. I mean, you've seen how the candidates have been basically going at each other's throat. They, they continue with each passing moment, Bob, make themselves look dumber and dumber. I mean, I think uh, Rick Perry and Bachman are in a competition as to who can say the stupidest thing. Like, you know, for example, Rick Perry confused the voter age, and then the other day Bachman said, if I'm president, I'm closing the uh, – the uh, <laughs> embassy in Iran, uh, that's all nice and good, Michelle, but unfortunately that uh, embassy has been closed for quite some time. And, when, you know, <laughs> Herman Cain's BS and now um, Newt Gingrich, I mean, he has so many skeletons in the closet that that baby's having to be, you know, forced closed. So I, I think that Ron Paul has a chance, Bob. Oh, I think he's got a very good chance. And what they've done in keeping his – uh, his uh, uh, television time down to an absolute minimum has enraged people, not just the people who follow him, everybody else. I mean, people notice these things. They're not dumber than dumb. Uh, they're just a little dumb. They can't read or write, but they can still see what's being done. And people are enraged. And what has happened is the tables are turned, and now it's become a big positive for Ron Paul. It'll be interesting to see how he does in this Iowa primary, so to speak. Uh, I think it's supposed to happen, what, Saturday or Sunday or something? I believe so. I think it was. Yeah. It'll be, you know, if he's anywhere near the top, uh, that is a, a tremendous reversal. And uh, you know who's putting them there? The young people. we got to get the old people, the people like me. Old people, you've got to get out and vote for Ron Paul and everybody like him and boot out all these people who vote for things like this uh, Military Appropriations Act. And that's very important. And why is it important? And I know how you think, because I'm in your age group, and you say, ah, I don't want to bother. I'll be dead soon anyway. Do you have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, of course you do. Do you want them to live in slavery or live the decent life that you've lived? That should motivate you. All of you throughout the country should be out there stomping for Ron Paul and everybody who says that they're like Ron Paul and they're running for office. You should help them. And I will have an, uh, a list as soon as it's available of who voted for this bill in the Senate. And I want every one of those scumbags out of office. I mean, this is the ultimate. I mean, how can we continent something in the United States of America to give away our freedom by our elected representatives to subject us to the rules that we would treat foreign spies. It's dreadful. And you people are standing by doing nothing. Well, do something. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's time for people to get off their asses, Bob. And, you know, it's, it's gotten to that point now where, you know, we need everybody out there that still cares about the direction this country is going for not just their future, but the future of their children, grandchildren, and future generations to take charge now. And the Iowa caucus is coming up in uh, January 3rd, 2012, so it's uh, 32 days away. So in about 30 days, we're going to start seeing the results coming in through the caucuses, the primaries. And this, and like you've been saying, Bob, this is our last real chance to turn things around in this country is with Congressman Ron Paul. The others aren't going to do it. Herman Cain isn't going to do it. Michelle Bachman, Gingrich, you know, Perry, uh, Mitt. Well, Gingrich Obama. is too busy ch switching wives. Yeah, exactly. And evidently, uh, Mr. Cain um, is a Lothario. Mm -hmm. So you can count them out. And then you get the background of Rick Perry, who's a bisexual. I mean, these people are a real piece of work. That's why Ron is the only one left for Wall Street to go against uh, the, that person who thinks he's president of the United States. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's scumbaggery. Uh, it, it doesn't get any worse. 
You're right. It doesn't get any worse <laughs> until the next uh, puppet president, unfortunately. And speaking of elections, Bob, as we uh, turn to the Middle East, it looks like uh, breaking news. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has taken the elections in Egypt by storm uh, over the uh, primary elections. So that's not exactly good news for <laughs> our efforts well, in Well, they're controlled Egypt. by uh, MI5 from Britain and the CIA, and they have been since 1923. Uh, they're fascistic in nature. Uh, nationalists, uh, extremists, and they sent two divisions of soldiers with their own mullahs and their own food and everything during World War II to fight on the Eastern Front against the Russians for the Nazis. So that tells you where they're coming from. Exactly. I mean, these are not good people. I mean, I know things in Egypt were bad before with Mubarak running things, but I think the situation in Egypt has gotten even worse than that, if you can imagine it. Uh, the public doesn't realize there. They don't have the information. Not a lot of them speak English. They can't hear broadcasts like this. We do have people out of the Middle East, but not many. Uh, it's um, uh, Europe, Asia, Latin America, Mexico. These are our strong places where we get people from. Uh, we get people in Hong Kong and Singapore and um in japan and uh and all over latin america but i'm pointing this broadcast toward americans the young people i don't have to talk to they're getting it the people in the middle between 40 and 65 some of them get it there's enough to be happy about the old people, we need them all because they've got the time to go out and help. They've got the time to go out and vote and do it. Absolutely do it. We need you. We've got to stop them. If we don't, you're going to die. Do you understand that? Yeah, it's really sad. I mean, I, I love my grandparents, you know, both my grandma on my dad's side and my grandfather on my fa father's side, I mean, my mom's side. And, you know, he's a smart man, brilliant man, lifelong Republican. And, you know, he and I on his 86th birthday kind of got into a debate about Herman Cain. And I was trying to explain to him that, look, Papa, this, this 999 plan sounds all well and good. But if you go look into it and research it, you realize that it's, it's, it's bad. It's terrible. It's going to make things worse. And it's just, I mean, I've been spending the past four years trying to talk him and my grandma and everyone else in my family into supporting Ron Paul. I mean, there's been some victories there. I mean, I've swayed some people, but most of them just buy into the mainstream media propaganda. They say, he's a kook. He has no chance to win. He's unelectable. The same talking points. And you just want to go up to him and just knock the crap out of him. <laughs> well, just tell them that when they come to collect you and they tell you can't have medical, medical care and you're going to be allowed to die, see how you like that. And see how you like the fact that they're going to put your son and daughter-in-law in an internment camp. And your, gr your grandchildren, they're going to tell them where and how they're going to live and where they're going to work, et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of life these people are going to lead because of you. You made it happen. That, that's the irony here, Bob, because most of these people you're talking about make up the greatest generation. Those like my grandfather, who was a flyboy in World War II, who fought against tyranny. Can't even see the tyranny in front of us. Well, they it's did a good amazing. job of brainwashing him, but all we can do is keep on pounding on him because the votes are very, very important. And we want everybody over 18, or depending upon where you live, to be in the voter lines, to be participating in the campaigns, it's extraordinarily important for your future. Because I'll tell you something. After the next election, if Ron Paul doesn't get in, there will be, within a year, a takeover of the retirement plans, and you're going to end up with zilch, you old people. And they will put on what I call a... I can't think of what it's called. Um... They will put on controls, currency controls, 
and they will also put on controls as to who can leave the country and who cannot. And everything that you pay for outside the country, you will pay for before you go. So that means that money won't leave the country. It'll stay there. And the people on the other end will get credits and they'll match them up. I've lived in currency blocked countries. South Africa during a pie hike and also in Rhodesia, both during the early 1970s. I lived there for several years, and for, fortunately, I had the perceptive perception to get out before the Civil War got really bad in what is now Zimbabwe. And I would have been right in the middle of it, because of where I lived was a prime target for the African communist terrorists. And one of those terrorists, Robert Mugabe, is running the country today. And, uh, and I went through the same thing in South Africa. And uh, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be there. You know, it's like living in a prison. You can't use your own money. You can't go out. Or living on an island. I used to live in the Bahamas. You talk about island fever. Nothing to do. Forget it. I lasted about a year and a half there or something like that. Anyway, that's what you're facing, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I've, I've been there. I lived it. This is straight skinny from a guy that's been there. You know, I don't get paid to do these broadcasts. 40 hours, 35 hours a week telling you people what's really going to happen, what's really going on from someone who's got vast experience, obviously, you've got to listen. It's extraordinarily important for your future and the future of your entire progeny for many generations. If these Nazis take over this time, you'll never get another chance at them. No, you're right, Bob. This is our last real chance here to turn things around. With any hope of turning this this ship around from you know the course it's been on for far too long and and I, i'm not living in a fantasy world i realize it's, it's not just going to take ron paul it's going to take us getting the presidency and getting congress which means we're also going to have to start running and for senatorial and congressional offices too but what ron paul does is by getting him in there it, it creates a foothold for us to where we can get on the beach and, and storm, you know, the uh, the garrisons and, you know, win the day ultimately. But it's, it's not going to come without sacrifice. And that's one thing that I do admire about the Ron Paul supporters is that despite how t bad things are economically, where people are having to decide, you know, whether to, you know, buy crap from uh, China for Christmas or put, you know, food on the table, there are people out there that are, are making the financial sacrifice to support the Ron Paul campaign and that's very admirable, in my opinion. You're not seeing that from anyone else. No, all the other money is coming out of Wall Street, transnational corporations, insurance companies. They're the ones who want to enslave you. I saw it in Germany during World War II. I lived during that time. I worked as counterintelligence in one of those facilities that was used to facilitate the war, the IG Farben building in Frankfurt. I saw yeah. Germany after the war was over. A lot of it was cleaned up, but there was still, I guess you'd call them empty buildings. Rubble. You know, I found it very interesting that the General Motors plant in Kien and the IG Farben building were never bombed. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Well, I tell you, when I when I put it all together, uh, and it didn't take me but three to six months to do that, I knew that I had the wrong job, but I was going to learn everything I could, mm -hmm. and I did, and I was very good at what I did. And when I departed, they tried to recruit me for NSA and and CIA, and I said no, I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go out in life, and I. They plagued me for years trying to get me to join with them. In fact, there's another program now with NSA that people have 
advanced high-speed computer equipment, they'll let you work at home doing their dirty work. It's incredible what's going on. And of course, when I was involved, the CIA and the NAS were, NAS, NSA, uh, they were very new at that time, only several years old, although the CIA had been the OAS uh, prior to 1948. But uh, another interesting thing, too, is all the people I worked with were all super bright. I mean, the brightest group of people I've ever been with. And so government recruited anybody who had a good brain. And uh, they knew what they were doing. And I don't know what happened to all the people, except one of them, he became one of the top people in the State Department. He used to room with me. But other than that, um, I lost track of everybody. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're definitely playing against a a very uh, talented team that's up against us, Bob. And I, I believe that in the end we can win because we are the majority of the people of the planet, not just here in the U.S., but throughout the rest of the world. And I think with every single thing that they do, the, the worse and worse they make things, such as what's going on in the Middle East, and we'll talk about that as well in the final few minutes we have left, if they continue to do things worse economically, financially, and even through war, it's only going to add fuel to the fire and wake even more people up. Well, I think you're right. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this, and you wouldn't either. But um, we've got to get enraged. We've got to get the people going. We've got to get the people helping with Ron Paul and people like him. And we've got to make sure it happens. If it does not happen, most of you are going to be dead. You don't get it. You're dealing with monsters. That's very true. And it looks like that they're really, really pushing for a major conflict in the Middle East, Bob. I mean, you have several scenarios here. I mean, obviously the one we've talked a lot about with, you know, Israel, U.S., the U.K., you know, threatening to bomb Iran, what's new there. <laughs> but then you have what, what happened a couple days ago with those NATO strikes again in Pakistan, killing uh, 24 soldiers in Pakistan. They once again shut down the supply lines. But this time, Russia is also threatening to shut down supply lines to Afghanistan as well. And you have China there, you know, also, you know, once again, siding with them. So there, there seems to be a growing conflict right there over these supply lines. Plus, you look at what's happening in Syria. I mean, it's obvious that they're planning on making Syria the next uh, Libya. And the U.S. fleet's there, and now the Russian fleet's going to be there as well. So it looks like there's going to be a major standoff coming up. Well, I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to be in the American Navy because the Russians get better equipment. And that's going to be a very, very terse fight. There's not going to be any winner there. And those two go at it. Uh, they're going to get hurt equally, and it's going to be very devastating, particularly to the United States, because they're used to winning everything. And it isn't going to happen. No, it's not. And it's definitely not a good sign. And, I mean, I, I had a feeling this was coming eventually, where eventually after – you know, pushing people around on the schoolyard and, you know, trying to, you know, hold people up for the milk money, eventually a couple of the others are going to say, you know what, we've had enough of this. And, you know, we're going to come take you on. And that's exactly what we're seeing transpiring. Well, the big if here is we don't know which side Russia is really on. The leadership. And I can't tell you that because I don't know. But uh, I worked against them. They're very bright people. And uh, I don't know what they're up to. I know they love running my articles, but other than that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's true, though. I mean, the Russians are very smart about that. They don't exactly, you know, throw it out there. They keep you guessing about what they're going to do. And that actually is really good strategy on their part. But there's no doubt that that they're probably kind of fed up with our shenanigans. I mean, we've. At one, once upon a time, you know, the Soviets were seen as the bad guy, but when the Soviet Union fell, you know, we started taking things a little too far, by design, of course, the powers that be. And a lot of American people just don't realize it, that we became the bad guy. And it's just sad. I hate to say it, but 
it's just the nature of the beast. We've become too big, too powerful with this nation building, with this empire, just like Ron Paul talks about. And it's gone completely off off the, the tracks that the founders had intended for us to be on. We don't have any semblance of constitutional government. Our court system, is, we lost it long ago. And the political agenda just deteriorated year after year after year. Nobody wanted to hear it. Well, you better hear it now. When you see legislation we like, we saw it pass today. You don't want to be there, kids. I know what these people are capable of. Yeah, I mean, they're capable of some pretty nasty things, and it's just so, so ironic that they're, they're threatening Iran, you know, a totalitarian regime, threatening Syria, a totalitarian regime, yet at the same time, what about the big totalitarian regime, our regime? They continue to ignore that one. Of course, they're part of it, so, you know, they, they definitely don't want to put themselves in the, in the gallows, but um, they don't realize that they are. And that's something I made a point about on a podcast the other day when I was talking about the, this um, 1867, is that these senators are, don't realize it, but those who are voting in favor of this are, in the end, going to be nailing their own coffin. They're, they're turning themselves into terrorists. And what's to stop the military from coming after them as well? And they will. Every country in the past that's had these totalitarian regimes, at least in modern times, all the helpers, the people who got them into power, they go around and liquidate them. They did that in Germany with the brown shirts, and they did that in the Soviet Russia as well. Look what they did in the Ukraine. It was horrible. Now, these are the kind of monsters you're dealing with. I mean, Joseph Stalin, 1938, wiped out half of the officerial corps. Anybody he thought might be a threat to him and their families as well. So if you don't think it can happen here, you're mistaken. And the truth is, Bob, it's going to happen. Because, if you, as you point out, it's happened time and time again throughout history. And it also serves another purpose to give the illusion to the people that the military or the whatever the, the hero of the day is going to be that comes in and takes out you know these, these crooks and cronies is actually doing a good thing by taking them out. When in truth, they're just you know, going to take it to the next level. There'll be stages. And we're going through this coming year all kinds of things that are going to change those stages. And one of them is going to be financial and economic. Social, you'll lose your freedom even further. Uh, I don't think before the election they'll start collecting people, but after the election they will if we don't elect Ron Paul. And... Uh, where they'll swoop down on people like me who are still in the United States, and they will incarcerate them immediately. And they'll try to pass legislation, which they have made up, to keep us off the Internet, out of the radio. They'll do everything they can. And that's absolutely true, Bob. It's happening right before our very eyes. You know, they're, they're trying to pass new legislation right there to censor the Internet even further to add more controls over it. And that's the end game. They claim it's all about uh, piracy, you know, going after um, websites that are selling, you know, pirated goods and, you know, fake uh, purses and whatnot. And that's what they always do with their PR movement, <laughs> the propaganda machine. It's like, oh, we're doing it for that. But then they always eventually get around to the real reason why they put these things into place, such as the War on Terror and the Department of Homeland Security. Subversion under another name. Exactly. And all these poor saps play into it. When anything goes wrong, they throw money at it and let you pay for it. You can imagine right now, and for the last three years plus, you've been paying to bail out European and American bankers. The people who want to destroy you? The best thing that can happen to America and the world is for the insolvent banking system to collapse because it takes away their seat, their key to power. And that's very important. We want those people out of power. 
And then we can deal with them. And then we can go to a better life. But we've got to do it. And we've, when, that, when we see that collapse, we've got to move. Yeah, and it's not a question of if, it's when it's going to happen. Because, I mean, you can only continue to, you know, use the buckets to try and stop the ship from sinking, especially when it's already hit the iceberg. Uh, there is an email question in the final minute we have left, Bob, from uh, Robbie. And I'm, I'm sure you, you, you'll probably have a good answer for this. Bob, what is your take on uh, purchasing gold and silver at this point in time? Well, if you take official inflation rights, since 1980, when gold was $850 an ounce, you will find that gold should be selling at $2,500 an ounce based on that. So we're way under that. If you take unofficial inflation, which was a formula they used in 1980, you will find that gold should be selling at $8,700 an ounce. Silver is, is different. I, I won't go into that. But based on that, you want to buy with both hands after <laughs> you've gotten in dehydrated, freeze-dried food, a filter, assault weapons, and plenty of clips and ammo. Ten full 30-shot clips on semi-automatic will last you four to five minutes in a firefight. So you better have them. After that, you're on your own. The I next agree, thing Bob. you do is you get gold and silver coins and gold and silver shares. The big money, historically, has always been made in the shares. But you should also have coins all the time. I recommend 30% in gold and silver coins split equally and 50, uh, 70% in gold and silver shares because that's where the money's made. And I will be there to get you out when you should get out, and I'll tell you what to do with that money. And I don't charge anything to anybody except for a subscription to the publication. Exactly. And, Bob, in the final minute left, how can people get that subscription? The international forecaster is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world. We publish on Wednesday and Saturday by email, 35 to 50 pages, 35 to 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the internet. All the things that you need to know each week are in that publication. You can get a free introductory copy by going to the international forecaster.com the international f o r e c a s t e r.com or the www.intforecaster.com intforecaster.com for those of you who have questions you'll email us we answer everybody we'll send you either copy by using that address. And we have a report on gold and silver shares, if you'd like that as well. You email Bob, B-O-B, at I-N-T-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R.com. Bob at intforecaster.com. And for those of you who want to call toll-free, that number is 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. And get either copy, and for those of you who want to become subscribers, they have a special offer there, free one-year subscription. The offer they're making is terrific. Take advantage of it. And it is a great deal for the holiday season. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. I will talk to you the next week, sir. Gotcha. Thank you all for listening. Bye-bye.